Mr. Paul Farrington, we go again. Oh, that does sound nice. I uh, quite like that. That has a much better ring to it than, than Mr. McAnally. Um, <laughs> although maybe maybe I should just say I go because I have this is my first time. I haven't gotten again yet. But uh, yeah, it's good to be here. Now you see, you see, in a somewhere in an alternate timeline, this would be your two promoters, one pod, this sort of rich Tory accent and this v Irish accent, and there would be no Kirsty's metal hands. <laughs> there would be no curly wurly and loose Bruce. And as pleasant as I'm sure these two bams would be, it would not have the it would not have those same jokes. So how are we, gents? We're all good. We are good. Surviving. Surviving. It was a busy weekend, a hectic weekend, but yeah. It was a great weekend. Aye, it's uh, it's taken us a few days to get out. And my voice is still and I don't even I don't even recall a, a time when my voice when I was screaming or shouting, but my voice is just it's there. I still feel a bit hazy, a bit of bubble, but let's I let's have a proper a proper damnation debrief. So yes. James, how are you, sir? Mate, well, my internet has tells you exactly how I am. I am a broken husk of a man who is wondering if he left his soul in Manchester and if it'll ever be returned to him. Did I you genuinely a... mean that. <laughs> did you... you can pick it up next year. Did you have a good one? Did you have, did you have a good weekend? We'll get about all the, the specifics, but did you have a good one? I had an absolutely brilliant weekend. Too much fun. Too much fun. I've I've really uh, hurt myself quite significantly. And I'm still, it's now Wednesday and I'm still feeling like I can't return to normal. I had yeah, way too much fun. Too many late nights. Too many bands. Too many beers. How's the How's the brother and your friend? Did they Did they go hard with you for the whole duration, or did they get talked up at some point? No, no. Shifty and Rob, uh, they went hard as well. So I think uh, me and Rob have been moaning all week at each other. Basically, Rob's decided that he, mu- he must be ill. It's not like a hangover anymore. He's like, I'm just. I think I've just come down or something. It's like, no, you're yeah, just you, old. Keep telling yourself that, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well this episode will be the Damnation Debrief the ultimate review we have Mr Paul Farrington with us he is the um, the left hand side of Damnation has been with us for forever, we have done we've done a few debriefs down the years, they've always proved pretty popular for us so yeah. the, the, the masses were asking for you to make your debut in Two Promoters One Pod Plenty happy to be here, yeah that's a uh... I really enjoy listening to them. It's nice to be on out on this side as a guest for a change. Yeah, it's awesome. I uh, yeah. at, at half past two in the afternoon, I should not be drinking a cider. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm getting Meadow Street tonight, and I thought, fuck it, let's uh, let's go. So, how's everything been post damnation, other than blurry and mental? We put the tickets back in sale on the Monday, and we've done so far another fifteen hundred blind for. Next year, which yes, brilliant. It's, it's pretty wild. It's weird. That I mean, it's incredible. You think what a start, what a start, and we we needed we needed like your child. We're going two days next year. It's a, a proper two days. I mean, this whole thing is a, a is all dreaded two days. A proper two days, Saturday and Sunday, all damnation. Will there be a night of salvation? Most likely, but it won't be at Beck. It'll be somewhere else in Manchester. We'll go way back to what it was meant to be in the start before it became its own its own snowball, it became its own issue. So Saturday and Sunday, we've never hosted on a Sunday before. Two full days of damnation. James has got exactly 12 <laughs> months. <laughs> 12 months to get yourself in shape. Yeah, I'm going to need it. I'm going to need it. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. it's, so, but, so it's going to be that, exciting though. It's going to be exciting. Thank you so much to everyone who who has showed their support for that because we, we appreciate it. It's a much higher ticket price, obviously. We've been two days and it takes a lot to commit to that and everyone who has, it's massively appreciated. Yeah, I don't think I don't think when you're buying your ticket or securing your ticket for the five quid plus the, the booking fee, which we had reduced to 5%, that you realise just how much stress you're taking off our shoulders through Christmas, New Year, and they start a new year. I, I mean, as a promoter, James, it's like just having those pre-sales is a massive, massive boost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a huge difference. You, you're taking on a massive risk every year. So, yeah, it feels good. And I think it, it just really reflects how much of a good time everyone had. I mean, when you guys woke up on the 
for Sunday morning. Did were you feeling good? Like it had gone well? I know Gav, you said you didn't. Um, you said to me a couple of times during the festival that you weren't looking at Facebook during the or social media just because you just wanted to enjoy yourself and be in the moment. Did you feel like it had gone well? Was that your obviously those sales suggest it went well? So was that your gut feeling as well? Yeah, I mean, then right, right off the bat. It did feel, I mean, we'll get to the, the the specifics of sort of any wobbles we had over the course of it. I had a, I had a weird feeling at Damnation this year, and I mentioned this to a few folk. At, it was the first one, uh, for whatever, despite the fact that I saw some of my favourite sets I've ever seen at Damnation, how smooth it went, how well everyone seemed to be enjoying themselves, how much we were enjoying ourselves, and the fact that for two days I was pretty much walking about my can in my hand with a not a lot to do. It felt like work for the first, like, I genuinely like a job, and I, and I don't mean that, but I'm sure when you're a football player, getting out there and playing football, still feels like it is your job, I'm not saying it felt terrible, and I wasn't enjoying it, but it felt like work, there was a, there was a real focus this year, and the fact that this has to work, not, not because I want to go and enjoy myself, and get drunk with my pals, but it has to work, because this is my career, and if it doesn't go, and finish, then I don't have a career, and there was something about that, like this, this fucking boulder that was on my shoulder for the whole day, and I felt myself getting into bed at the early hours of Sunday morning, and I didn't even mean it, but I, I let out this side, I, I feel like it came from my toes, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> I just, that's my whole body just went, what is that, it happened, it fucking happened, I mean all the rest of the bonuses about how great it was, of course we want that, but it was just something, like, it had to work, and uh, it did feel like work, Whereas there's definitely been some damnations that, that Fro will talk about in a second. Well, we've been running a bit fucking topless, jumping off stages, and it's all been a bit too much like just two fans that were involved in a gig that they happened to be responsible for. Whereas this was very much me like, no, we're no fucking about with this. It's, I, I'm a fan first and foremost, but this is how I make money. It needs to work. Yeah. So that's how I felt. How did, how did you feel by Sunday, Fro? Um... I probably felt better than you because it's not my job. So if it goes if it goes under, you're the one in the dark queue. I can still uh, pay my mortgage. Um, but yeah, no, I was just there was just a real immense kind of sense of 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 pride with it in terms of how well it went. Um, yeah, there was no major hiccups, but it also it felt for me like there was a an extra level of professionalism that we'd actually brought into it this year in terms of of how we were doing things. Um, I think the bands noticed that as well. Uh, the bands, like just in terms of arrival times, how everything was done very, very smoothly. And yeah, it felt good kind of taking that next, because I think that's where we're at now. We've got a good space in terms of the venue. And then it is about all these kind of just the incremental little improvements. And I felt there was there was quite a few on the, not necessarily anything that the fans would see, but just in terms of the organisation and the layout and how we we put the whole kind of couple of days together, I think. And so I was really quite pleased with that on on Sunday going back to the venue on Sunday morning was just the most awful thing though because that's that's the downside and you'll know this James as well I don't know whether when you're at trees or arc tangent doing the breakdown afterwards when you've had the the massive highs the big adrenaline rushes to actually go there and be boring and productive and break up Harris fencing and and put things back where they're supposed to be is just like the worst feeling in the world yeah it's it's pretty brutal do, do, did you guys stay that night the Sunday night or did, did you all gone no, no. thankfully it was enough for the team showed up because it, that, that's a that's a very sliding scale and with the crew because at that point we know we need to show up and Brian will be there and Angela came last year but how many of the crew are actually crawling back into their bed to come and, and a few did and just one extra pair of hands feels like an army when it comes to breaking up Harris fencing and cutting down banners and collecting, I mean, removing fridges out of cabins and you're doing that. It's the worst job in the world when you either want to just be in bed sleeping or or partying somewhere, you know what I mean, just enjoying what, what, you've, what you've achieved. But James, I mean, we don't need to tell you this. I mean, you do that times a thousand in mud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the reason I ask that is because at least for me, we we still we stay there for like four four extra nights, which is quite nice in the evening, even though you're broken. And yeah, the pack down is not very fun. And and you, you kind of want it to be over. It's really nice to have that debrief and, and a couple of drinks every evening and a barbecue just to like sort of, decompress it whereas you guys are like in pack down and then yeah off in your electric yeah. van up the road that's a weird one as well we don't get there is never any real proper damnation debrief in the sense of the people you're with so yeah. Paul goes back to his family I go back to my family and my daughter and my mum and dad and, and Kelly were there but 
they're, they're no they're no metal fans. They don't care about how dragged into sunlight we are. They don't care about the chaos for nails. It's a uh, so you can back up the road and, and it's like you do want that. I, I remember that after my wedding day as well. Like the next day it was just me and my wife and we had this fantastic day, but we had no one to tell about it. It was like we yeah. were getting ready and going to go on a honeymoon. And that's what damnation feels like every single year that you really want to be broken in a pub somewhere with Paul, Bri, Angela, Natasha, Mike, the team, everyone there and just go, oh, how was it for you? And what did you see? And did you see when that happened? And this happened backstage? But you're up the road and it's like, hey, get that packed lunch done because Charlotte's going to school at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. that is the, I, I, I do as much as I appreciate how much work uh, must be in, in deep or, or bringing down both your festivals having that opportunity to be with everyone that was involved for a few nights and share a drink and some stories must be a lot of fun and also yeah. just before we move on because there's some big news regarding the, the pod and the tour I want to thank the um, the whole team that were there as Paul alluded to part of this podcast or something I've learned for this podcast and talking to yourself James is the responsibility that's passed about some members of your team said I've been one perfect example where you've got areas of it where you just trust people to do that. And we've been terrible at that basically forever. Yep. And this year we brought on Angela for advancing and she was fantastic. Bry's always been fantastic, but you need to name, name check him. Brought on Natasha for the merch, fantastic. Get said to Mike, please gonna look after the, the sort of volunteer crew. They all showed up, they were fantastic. Mario also does a production. So there was a lot of bits of damnation where definitely in previous years, myself and Paul have just been stressing about stuff that we've got no control over. We don't have any yeah. expertise in. We don't have any real professional opinion to offer. We just know there's a problem. And you're just in the middle of it. Whereas this year, knowing that the guys had taken those jobs on and all smashed them was, was incredible. So I just wanted to say before we go into anything else, thank you to everyone who came on board. And I know there's a million names that, that I'll not get to, and you always miss Sunday, but you know you're appreciated, so thank you. Good. And look, I want to say thank you to you guys, because your hospitality for me and my brother and Shifty was, and Simon came as well, um, was rem- amazing. We really appreciate it. You properly looked after us. Um, a fridge full of beers on a balcony was very much appreciated. And uh, yeah. Well, you're always yeah. you're, you're always welcome. Always welcome. Did you ever see? Did you ever, there was a picture of you. I only saw this when I get back onto social media afterwards, and you were standing almost alone on the balcony, but just a silhouette. Somebody's going, "Who's this ominous looking man?" And somebody goes, "I think that's Jim Scarlett." <laughs> <laughs> just overlooking damnation by yourself. <laughs> that's good. What a great view from up there. I mean, it is. Sell, it's great. You should sell tour tickets to that view because it's when it was packed for like. Um, Russian Circles, Nails, Gate Creeper, that sort of Saturday afternoon, the view from up there was fucking amazing. Um, really yeah. great. So, um, yes. look, like you said, we're going to talk about Damnation today, but before we do that, we're going to talk about our tour, because it's happening. There is a two promoters, one pod live tour happening in March. Fuck me. It is fucking happening now this is a as you say we've talked about this for a long time and then in the last what, month or so Hayden's been beavering the way in the background with a uh, with different promoters and we've been getting sort of drips and drips. this is this is it tomorrow your tomorrow i.e friday 10 a.m tickets are on sale for two promoters one tour the first tour and where are we playing playing performing whatever the fuck it is we do where are we doing that james <laughs> okay so the these dates are all in march so it's uh thursday the 20th in bristol friday the 21st in birmingham saturday the 22nd gloucester sunday the 23rd london friday the 28th glasgow saturday the 29th manchester and sunday the 30th in leeds so that's bristol birmingham gloucester london glasgow manchester and leeds and the Seven way that, and the way that we've decided to do this is it breaks into almost like two weekends because we're a bit already shitting ourselves about selling tickets, but then try to sell a ticket to a podcast Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is probably not great. So it works out like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, then it's a break, and then we come back and then hitting Glasgow, Manchester leads to the fall, following weekend. So they're all pretty much on weekend dates as well. What have you got to say? I'd also be worried. I'd, I'd be worried about the pair of you surviving if you went for seven days straight. I'm not sure you'd make it as far as Leeds <laughs> by the end of it. So four day break in the in the middle is probably sensible. I, well, I would have disagreed with you until I just got back from damnation, and I'm like, I totally agree. Two oh, days, isn't it? Um, it's a, uh, it's I don't know. It's a bit terrifying. I think I'd have probably went three dates. Let's see if somebody comes in in your mum's 
basement, but no, we are going to we're going to some decent. I mean, the Bush Hall in London. <laughs> that just sounds intimidating. <laughs> yeah, it's pro proper venue. So look, um, contrary to what Gav says, this this is going to sell out. I mean, these venues are small. Most of them are small. So I'm I'm not worried. I'm thinking, get your fucking tickets now because it, it's going to fly. There's yeah. like places like Bristol and Birmingham, not a, a little venue. So yeah, and. <sighs> Yeah, I want to be positive about this, James. I want to be positive about this, James. <laughs> and also, listen, you put your trust in people. It's worked for us with this podcast. We asked where people wanted to come. People were saying they would, ticket, they would buy tickets the second they went on sale. Please do that. These promoters have put their faith in us. An agent's put her faith, his faith in us. We are going to come out there and do it. It won't be the same show night after night. We're going to come and do shows specific to that, uh, that city. And we'll decide whether whether we're bringing on guests, what the exact setup's going to be. But I mean, if you caught us at up tangent, you kind of know the gist of it. So, aye, it's a it's mildly terrifying. It would help a lot. This was this was not the week I needed to be this to be happening. <laughs> <laughs> the timing the timing for this has been atrocious, but it is what it is. It's happening tomorrow, ten a.m. James is right. Some of these uh, some of these venues are not massive, so please. Grab them, getting them sold out would be the most ridiculous thing that's probably ever happened to me. And then uh, we will absolutely smash it on our side. So the question for you, Paul, where do you come to see us, pal? Oh, because I was like, do I want to do do I want to do Glasgow on a Friday night or Sunday in London? Because Sunday London one is the easiest one for me. Or I could do both. I might do I might do London. I might do London and Glasgow. Right. Um so yeah, so I'll, I'll definitely be along to at least one of them. Um, I know a few yeah. people are already planning. Like my mum, my all my family are from Shepherd's Bush, so they're already planning a London trip for the family to to come to London. So yeah, I could go and hang with the Scarlet Clan. Then. Yeah, do it. Ab yeah. Ab absolutely. So yes, what else? Nothing else to say. That we will be talking about this tour over the next couple of months. We will be uh, get sharing ideas. I mean, like this podcast. If there's something you feel we can bring to the table in those live sets, live shows, then uh, talk to us about that as well. The the thinking right now is there'll be a section, and let's say 45 minutes, an interval, so we can all grab a drink, another 45 minutes, and then we can all have a drink together afterwards. So that's the that's a rough plan of uh, of how it's going to look, and it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. We are going to drag Hayden onto this podcast to discuss what it takes to put together. Uh, a tool like this, we will have a rider, we will have tool demands, and we'll talk about it all <laughs> in, the, in the weeks coming up to that. So, yes, brilliant. Talking about support, the last week we spoke, James, uh, I was in such a fucking haze. We never even bothered with the coffee. We completely missed the whole thing altogether. I think we discussed it and then just moved on. So there is no coffee, there is no coffee uh, subscriber from last week to do anything for this week. However, I will get caught back up in that now with Maxwell James. So Mr. Maxwell James, you drop us a line and let us know what you would like for the next episode. And on to the questions. Paul, you're going to help us out with these. Keep things going. Nice. Yeah. They point you sitting there like a third wheel. What have you got? There nice. you go. All damnation, my... related, all damnation related as well. So you will be responsible for answering them as well as asking them. So that is up. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. So the first one comes from Stuart Gelder. And he asked, how much do the pyro actually cost? And who fronts the bill, uh, the festivals or the bands? Um, and I guess this is one of the incremental changes we've made this year in terms of adding in a little bit of extra like, extra pyro and, and the likes. So yeah. the way the way it works is we it's it's kind of a shared cost, um, the pyro. And as with everything, the more of it you have, the more expensive it is. We damnation foots the bill for the techs who man it. So the the guys, the the special effects guys who are there on site to to man and control the the fire um and as much as anything that's more just to do with insurance on top of everything else we need to make sure we have the properly trained people there that there's no massive uh, issues and they have all the right credentials so we covered the cost of the text to man that for the day then the cost of the hire of them and the use of the gas was split between the bands who decided they wanted to use it on the day and that 
part of the cost. It's not massively expensive. Obviously, we had, for those who were at Damnation and I guess those who were kind of just listening, we had on our main stage, we had four flame cannons on the, on the main stage and then two on our second stage. Um, and they were used by five five bands over the weekend. So it wasn't that they were used massively, but they were just used enough just for nice little touches throughout the, the weekend. Yeah. And the cost the cost of those wasn't wasn't too crazy. The the biggest cost is actually the the hiring of the the techs for the day um to make sure that everything is there from a, a safe standpoint. Um and then The, the actual how much gas the more gas you use obviously the costs go up but we didn't use a huge amount so it actually was quite reasonable it was money that i was happy to spend out of gav's wallet and i'll be happy to do it again next year Yeah, I mean, it makes it like there's, there's no point in getting carried away. And he says, We've all seen a Ramstein show, we've all seen a Parkway Drive show, we know what pyro that's coming at the, the side of cages looks like. So, I'm off six cannons, isn't like all oh, look at us, but at the same time, it feels like it feels like you book Ramstein when you see fire for the first time at your event. You're like, Fucking hell. I mean, it just there was a few moments in that weekend where people weren't expecting it. I mean, drag will be one of the, the ones. Where it just goes. It just adds this new layer of intensity Extra level. to, to the show, and I, it's a, uh, it's mildly terrifying. It brings its own. Uh, it feels like another layer of risks and uh, the cost of with it. But I, it was nice to, it was nice to see it there. I, I, I definitely felt a, I definitely felt a wee pop every time went off. I was quite, I was quite chuffed with it. Now James is clearly. having some IT issues now. Are you with us, James? So, James, tell us about yourself. Firstly, the pyro. Do you feel the pyro added anything to the damnation? And what's your experiences are using pyro? When, uh, do you use the full bill, or is it shared with the bands? No, so the only time we've had it is Creeper and Don Broker, and they both just brought it themselves. I mean, my the question I had to you, and apologies about my internet, so I might have missed you already saying this, but do, is, there a, is there a safety thing when you... Because it's not like Creeper bring their own pyro, then they're in charge of safety, we just keep the crowd back and, and that's it. But for you, if, like, let's say, employed to serve are using your pyro, have you got to do some sort of safety briefing with each act that's using it, or how's... How's that work? So we we got the bands. We when we had the the techs, the company who who were doing it. We then essentially we'd spoken to the various bands. We're like, we're going to have some pyro on the main stage. Do you have any use, any interest in using it? And so we take employed to serve as an example. See, just they came back and said, yeah, we'd love to. And then at that point, then I just kind of facilitated a three way email between the SFX specialists and the tour manager for employed to serve and let them. work through the the details um then they will either have got a, a thorough briefing in terms of how to operate the pyro and the sfx guy will have been standing beside them when they used it and so because they will obviously the tour manager or whoever their lighting guy will know the the key moments that they want to use it in um and so they will have been briefed um or else the Uh, bands will have let the, the SFX guys to to trigger it at moments that kind of felt a little bit more appropriate, which I think was the case with Nails. Nails didn't have anyone. Um, and so they just kind of trusted the Which SFX is just, guy which to do just it. every fucking moment in the song. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. What, what was what was great about what was great? My favorite thing about Nails is because there's some bands who are like, okay, we're bringing in, you're using fire, it needs to be all very planned, risk assessed, all the rest of it. Nails kind of turned up on the day and went, oh, you guys have got pyro, can we use it? And that was that was about it. No kind of pre-planning, no nothing. It was just like, oh, yeah, we're happy to use it. And then um, way it went, like so. Yeah, I mean, because if you... Good for that. Well, yeah, I was in... Well, so just to answer the, the, the tail end of your question, as well, what the fans don't see, but you would have seen for the balcony, is the stage is all marked up. So you, when we're looking down for the balcony, you'll see this fluorescent um, orange line and then the, the, each unit... is fluorescent orange and on top of it. So basically when that pyro's on, if you're like, you do not do not stand in front of that or else the, the stage man will probably stop the show. So you're just about like, do not go beyond that line. It's it's, it's really that simple for like the edge of a building. Do not walk beyond the edge or else you're going to fall off. So I, that's, I'm sure there's a lot more to it, but just in your very basics are, how do you stop anyone from getting injured in a situation? It's like, there's a big red line. It's a fluorescent line. You say, do not walk past it. Okay, cool. Well, look, I thought it looked great. And and much like Arc Tangent, you get the benefit of being indoors in the dark. I mean, even more so, you get it. You know, it's 
you can make it dark, can't you? So it really, really mm -hmm. does, really does get the effect. Um, yeah, between that, between that and the screens, and then it's a weird one because a, a few people say, "Oh, they, they kind of get the gist of damnation now as the screens in all three stages." And I think people are a wee bit disappointed sometimes when it's just a logo goes up there. And so are we, you know, what I mean, the, the money's been paid in the screen. You like the bands to go and do like Pine or the Ocean and go and do other Celeste and use use footage with it, but the um, the problem with that is if every single band does it, it loses the... Sometimes you just need a logo or Russian Circles and Hex has just switched the screens off completely. You can't just have every band using the pyro and every band putting up like huge big videos or you just kind of get numb to the fact of that and it loses the whole essence of the production, you know what I mean? Yeah, and you can't make bands do what they don't want to do as well, so it's going to be it's going to be what it's going to be. Talking of doing what you don't want people to do, uh, Oli Gonzalez says... What or who the hell was the influencer during Russian Circles set? Now I can give a I can give a, a, a little bit of inside perspective on this. In that I was stood next to Gav when this was going on, and Gav was trying desperately not to look at the the influencer during Russian Circles set, but it, it was pretty hard to ignore from where we were standing. So do you want to explain what happened and what? Okay, you're, okay. So we don't we we on the balcony. Russian Circles start. I don't know if that was just really poor timing and this, we're calling it influencer, but really poor timing, that she picked the darkest, most atmospheric band of the entire weekend to do whatever the fuck it was she's doing. We think, we think it was a member of Butcher Babies. If that's not the case, I apologise. A few people have said we think it was one of the singers of Butcher Babies. It makes sense. They were on the bus with the with Cradle of Filth. And they appeared to be doing, shooting something because she was clearly singing to a camera. So she, they, they, they appeared to be, rather than doing a... When I, when I first spotted it coming into the side of the venue, I thought, fucking hell. But, like, influence, influencers are going to influence, you know what I mean? You're going to get some of this, like, in five, ten years' time, or just everybody's going to be in corners filming their own fucking TV show, aren't they? And uh, that's just going to be something that we see in buses and trains and everywhere in between, so... It's about like, okay, but fair enough. I'm tuning into Russian circles. But then, as you say, it was like a wasp. It was like you're trying to it was like a wasp in the distance. It was just wouldn't fuck off your ear. And that's well, she, she had a massive on. ring light, didn't she? Like yeah. the biggest, biggest fucking light you've ever seen in and a And She dark cut through set. the crowd. She came, she yeah. went round me and cut back through the crowd. So my wife is standing between me and you in this fucking busy balcony. And I can oh, so I'm hearing this, but at the same time, to be fair, my focus at the time was. Russian circles are on stage. I think if we're playing conduit, this is a fucking bird. This wasp is in the distance. This, is a, this fluorescent wasp is in the distance. But I mean, I'm still enjoying the show. And then weirdly, my wife does this sort of like tutty huff thing. And I was like, that's, a, that's an odd reaction to Russian circles. Are you okay? She's not into the heavy music, but I, like, you're not, you're not going to stamp your feet and walk away because Russian circles are so terrible. But I'm like, still, fair enough. I'm tuned into the, the show. Next thing I know is I look down and my wife's chasing. My wife's chasing this fucking woman with a, with a ring light, and she's like, "Yes, like to like cut it off." And I'm like, "What the fuck is going on down there?" And then she goes back up, and I'm like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> she goes, "She goes, that woman was driving me absolutely fucking. She was just driving me crazy." And I was like, "What did she say?" She goes, "Oh, she was American." She goes, "I got you, babe. I got you. I got you." She goes, "I don't give a fuck if you've got me. So why she fucking light off?" <laughs> and my wife, my wife is not confrontational she's not aggressive but I just think there's something about that she probably fuck do you know how long I've sat and watched my husband sit up to like one in the morning and knock him down for a family dinner I mean, and you you've come in here walk through a crowd in the darkest most bleakest fucking atmospheric band right in front of fans who are sit, are, are tuned in to watch it uh, on the basis of what so you can get some footage for your next music video or for something you put in TikTok which I guarantee won't mention Damnation won't be anything about us it'll just be like look at me I'm somewhere where we've got huge crowds which is obviously something that doesn't happen in the Butcher Baby shows so it's fucking I it was it was the whole the whole fucking five minutes thing was just it was just wild. Did you just know that, that Kate, it was Kelly that went down and fucking shit that, that got this? I do. I, I heard on social media some because someone posted on social media that it was Kelly done it. And fair play to her because it was. It was because I was up on the balcony as well. It was. It's really difficult. It's really distracting because it was such a bright light. You couldn't help but have it catch the corner of your eye. So yeah. So fair play to you, to Kel for going down and uh, politely telling her to stop. <laughs> <laughs> in madness, honestly, the madness, anyway. And also, here's another, here's another uh, sort of what happened there. 
Liam Knowles, how pissed off are you that bleeding through didn't play This Is Love, This Is Murderous and Fool when that's what you booked and that's what was advertised? I assume you had to pay a premium for the album set, which we didn't get. Well, <clears> I, <throat> I, like Paul, you, you answered that. Firstly, I didn't know, so I'm still processing the fact that that never happened. So uh, what, what's your take, Paul? Yeah, I found out after the fact. I think it was actually Liam came up to me in the building after his going, what happened to the album set? And I was like, what, what do you mean? And he said they played like five songs maybe off This Is Love, This Is Murderous and then added in like another three or four songs from from other albums. But it certainly wasn't certainly wasn't the full album. Um, and that was the first I had known about it. Uh, as far as we had been aware, what we had agreed, the plan was for the whole album in its entirety. We had certainly provided them a set long enough so they could play the, the album in its entirety. So, um, yeah, so that's definitely disappointing from our perspective because we don't want to be seen to be misleading fans that we're, we're selling them something that we weren't advertising. That was exactly what we were expecting. We were expecting the album in, in full. Um, I'm not too sure uh, why it wasn't. Um, I'm sure we'll probably have conversations with with bands and agents in, in due course if I know what happened with that. But yeah, it's not ideal when when that happens. Was it one of the ones that you'd paid? I mean, feel free to say you don't want to answer this question, but had you paid? Do you feel like you paid a premium for that? I, it's hard to tell because bleeding through are one of those ones, I suppose it'd be about like nails well. What would their actual fee be? Because it's, I mean, having been to the UK and God knows how many years, it's not like they're a touring band that you can just phone up your fellow promoter and go, how much did you pay the last time they landed in Bristol or Glasgow? So they were paid a, they were paid a premium and it was, now, the thing that was with this booking is there was no discussion at any point. Now, we'll get to the credit of Filth one in a minute, but there was no discussion with us that they didn't fancy it or it wasn't something they'd done elsewhere. They played This Is Love, This Is Murderous in full in America. So we went to them and there's no music out, new music out at that point either. So it was like, this is what you've got to offer. This is the big one that people know. And it's it's utterly bizarre because I have to say that Bleeding Through were an absolute pleasure to deal with. The whole weekend, they arrived, they were delighted, they were pleasant to everybody they met. I mean, like overly pleasant, just delighted that people wanted to see them. So... I don't know what the thinking was. I mean, it was advertised as that. They saw the advertising. They shared the advertising. They put it, like, the, the screen behind them was the album cover. Uh, I don't know how many tracks. I was trying to check there how many tracks are in total, but a lot is bonus material at the end. So I don't know if it's, like, 10 tracks and they played five or six from it and, and just stopped her. They added a couple of tracks on it at the other end after putting some new. I would need to go and look at the exact set list and how it shaped up. But it's sort of bizarre. I don't think it's happened to us before. The other bands that said they were going to play albums in full did play them in full in the order we would expect. And it's just I it's just it's just it's just a weird one because listen, we could have booked bleeding through, maybe paid a wee bit less and still had them in the same position and everybody would have been like, okay, you got to see Bleeding Through. But it's a weird one if you're a bit like, oh, that is my album. That's my jam from 2000, whatever it was, and I'm looking forward to hearing it in this order and they play out half and then and then mix it up. So I it's it's an odd one. Apologies. In behalf, I suppose, of damnation, but it's like you say, James, as well. You can't once say bands go on stage, they'll do whatever the fuck they want. You know what I mean? It's like you mm -hmm. feel like you've got a certain level of power, which is you can pull the plug, and that's where your power sort of begins and ends. Once they're on stage and they go up there and they tell you that the crowd that your festival shit or that they never agreed to do this or whatever, like you're it's like the, it's, out, it's out with your hands, you know what I mean? I think you've never had an yeah. experience like you've not booked that many album sets, but you've never had an experience where a band's told you something and went on stage and done something else. No, and obviously, I mean, I've had bands that they'll probably remain nameless that are, they're classic bands and I book them and they turn up and they only play new songs. The agent stood next to me and said, I'm really sorry about this. It's like they've turned up, <laughs> no one knows any of the songs. Um, <laughs> 10 points for anyone who can guess who it was, but. Um, it, that's pretty frustrating, but no, I've never had it. And obviously, I've got a couple of album sets coming at Arc Tangent this year, but I'm not even remotely concerned that those bands would do that. It doesn't feel like, you know, it wouldn't make any sense to offer to do those albums in full and then not do them. Yeah, it was yeah, a, it's weird. It's a weird one. It was a bizarre one. It was a bizarre one. Okay. Right. Another question. Right. Yeah, um, you tell me, was... amateur of this, James. Look at us, we were just <laughs> linking in like that. Like, with the, question <laughs> the amateur seems like, oh, right, it's my question. <laughs> but, no, all right. So, this one this one is for the two years. Um, and it was quite cool to see it. Uh, there was lots of um, 
the the two promoters one podcast merch kind of going around for the weekend so someone tom redmond's asking how much of the merch did you sell and was it weird seeing all the people wearing it um what was that like for you guys over the the course of the weekend i mean just to knock the first bit in the head i don't really know I, I, obviously some sold but there is a there's a big ball of what gavin doesn't know post down this year it includes final ticket sales final merch sales uh, final invoices for people. I mean, I've got there's so much still to be done post damnation. It would hurt your head, and it's probably why I feel a bit of this. It did sell, merch seemed to sell well. I don't know the answer to that. James, did you see much of it around? Well, I've been wondering the answer to that question as well. So, <laughs> James is <laughs> um, like, hey, that's my 50 percent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, I saw a bunch of it around. I mean, the, the being a Arc Tangent, 2000 Trees and Damnation has changed somewhat since the podcast has, has uh, like started. And it, it's kind of weird. I think if I wasn't with my friends, it would be okay. But it's made weird because my friends are with me. So you're having a conversation. Someone interrupts you and they want to say how much they like the podcast or they want to have a photo. And my friends take the piss out of me when it's happening. So it's like you, it's like this really weird thing where Shifty start, got to the point where he was just making notes on his iPhone every time someone... He was writing down why they'd come over. And, you know, it was usually the podcast. Very rarely it's festivals. It's like yeah. everyone's forgotten the festivals. But did you see that? There's that one guy who'd made, like, a loose Bruce sign and a curly whirly sign. To... So yeah. people were properly... Uh, and there was a... What was it? Tintin is a cunt. Tintin is a cunt, yeah. <laughs> Tintin is a cunt. Well, there's a fucking peach, man. <laughs> It's like, so how, am, how am I the cunt? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was That's wondering, a... James, with the with the the difference, whether there was whether you noticed the difference between being a damnation and I guess on when you're on home soil in terms of people coming up to you. So I would have guessed when you're at trees or arc tangent, you've got an earpiece in, maybe people are less reluctant or they're, they're kind of more reluctant to come up because like, oh, he's working, he's here we're, uh, on the job. Obviously at damnation you were clearly there just to enjoy yourself and whether that meant more people were happy to come up and go, can I get a photo or anything like that? I don't know. I think that um, in the dark, like I very rarely indoors at Damnation or indoors in the tents at trees or at nighttime ever get anyone coming up to me. And I think people, because it's you're much harder to recognise in the dark, obviously, I think. So it was when I was outside eating food and drinking beer at Damnation that people coming up to me and it's the same at trees in otg i wouldn't say it's it's more on home turf for me i was it was like well shifty's iphone note would tell us that it was like 60 or 70 people came up during the during a day and a half of being there so it's pretty it's pretty mad it's pretty like quite hard to get your head around but um yeah, yeah it's what, nice i'll tell you what I, I noticed which i really really felt a lot more comfortable with and enjoyed more not one, not one person over the whole weekend asked, are you Gav? None, not one, everyone, hi Gav. It was just like, it was universally accepted, I was Gav, rather than, because you get that odd one, it's like, not that it's, but you're at Art Tangent or Threes or even previous damnations, like, are you Gav, are you Gav? And you're like, I, I am Gav, but then it's like, well, it's people just like, they just felt more comfortable, like, that is definitely Gav, I want to say hello, great for the podcast, great for the festival, great whatever, or met your wife or your daughter's lovely, your mum's lovely. It was like, it just felt like you were more, I don't know, in a friend's house. It just felt like you were, you were passing a pal. It was just like, uh, whether they, you knew them or they recognised that you probably didn't know them because you hadn't met yet, but they'd listened to the fucking podcast. I mean, the amount of people that, <laughs> somebody came up to me and goes, I was ready to just go up to James and just launch into conversation because I feel like we're pals, but he's never met me. <laughs> it's, like, it's, a, it's a weird fight because I've got that. I've, there's a guy called Eddie Huwani who does an MMA podcast I've listened to for five years. Like, I know the names of his children and his wife and that they score goals at the weekend and his favourite fighter. Um, he's never, he doesn't know that I live, that I exist. So if you ever walked into a room, I'd be like, fuck. I'd be like, almost like a stalker. I'd be like, all right, anyway, how were things last weekend at the Nets game? And he'd be like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> well, you, you? You often spend the first couple of minutes of the chat working out if it is actually someone you know or not. Because yeah. they've talked to you like you know each other. It's like, fuck. Because obviously there's loads of like, there's quite a lot of music industry people there, like booking agents and other, I spoke to two or three other festivals um, and, and like some PR people. There's all sorts of journalists, all sorts of people there. And then so every so often you're like, shit, is this someone I know or is it just... Yeah. Yeah, it's I, weird. weird I, I got absolute Gavin Lerm 
from your mistakes, mate, is stop saying nice to meet you. And the amount of people I said nice to meet you goes, oh, I've met plenty of times. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that never stops hurting when that happens. It's like, yeah. stop saying, you've got nothing to gain for that sentence, Gavin. Nothing to gain. Stop saying nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a risk, definitely, that one. Oh. But, uh, but it's good. But, but the, the worst part of, like, um, sort of, going big at these festivals is that some of those meetings happen when you're not really at your in your best like you haven't got your show face on there was a guy on the so the track on the way home on the train there was all like all the toilets were broken and i was like re really hung over really needed the toilet and i'm like desperately frantically trying to find one on the train really unhappy with life and a guy just stopped me and just wanted to chat about the podcast he was like on his way home from he's on his way home from damnation as well and i'm like ah. Oh. Mate, this is not my best face. <laughs> this is not the time. <laughs> no. Okay, next question. Um, Dave Bird says, um, how frustrating is it seeing Bolt Thrower on wish list even after you've tried to shut it down immediately? It's it's not I don't get I don't get too, I don't get too worked up about it. I mean, end of the day, people even posting wish lists or being interested in the festival is, is massively appreciated and they have that level of interest. The bolt throw thing it I, the boat for a one, I get it. I get it. People are like, oh my God, one festival in the UK managed to get boat for it playing the whole time. It was us. If any festival could get boat for it come back, it'd probably us because if boat for it came back, it wouldn't be for money. It would be because they, they felt it was important for, I don't know, legacy or charity or whatever it was they do. It would be damnation we'd come back for. We haven't been disrespectful enough to even ask them, but we did. I did approach them about being involved next year in any capacity they'd like, like selling t-shirts for charity, just coming along as guests. I mean, anything just to mark it was going to be 20 years and how important they were to us. And uh, even that was a, a bit of a lukewarm response. So I don't, I mean, I don't think they're in a position where there even there's that much conversations happening between the, all the remaining members, never mind getting them back in a rehearsal room. So I, I get it. Listen, there's fucking, there's a... Um, there's reunions happening left, right, and centre for bands that said they would never ever play again. So, as a fan's point of view, like why what would make Bolt Thrower so unrealistic? But Bolt Thrower just one of those bands. It was never about money, and most of these reunions tend to be about money. Agree, Fro? Yeah, um, yeah. No, and I also get like you don't know what what people don't know, and yeah. So just because. Tom has asked about us getting ball thrown and Gav's given a reply saying it's not going to happen. It doesn't mean that Dave has seen the same reply on social media and he's equally just as excited to throw it out. They go, oh, what about ball throw? And they don't know, obviously, people might not always be tuned into every little nuance of a band and realise that the drummer has passed away and that for them, they were done with that. They might have just thought ball throw are just not in the, the mood of performing. So you don't always know what where the question is coming from and how much knowledge they have before they've asked that um but i would much rather people asking a hundred times about ball throw and showing any in in festival than nobody actually giving a shit as to who we were booking i'd much rather having everyone showing and putting suggestions across because it's useful for us for every every time someone mentions ball throw there's another 50 bands that are mentioning oh she shit that's a really good one i hadn't thought of them as well so i would always much prefer the repeated questions even if it's not going to to be the answer that they want, then, then no engagement at all. Yeah, you get the ones that do annoy me, though, or the, the ones that aggressively come on and say, you line up shit, you should book Anil Nathrak. And you're just like, get off the fucking internet. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> Anil Nathrak, <laughs> like a never present, but they just, they're just new at the festival and they don't like what you've got, but they're here to tell you that they love a band called Anil Nathrak and we should know about Anil Nathrak. And you're like, we booked our first fucking shows, you clown. You know what I mean? So day ones are the ones like, get dark front to play your second stage. Something like, that can kind of get dark front to headline their main stage. It's unlikely yeah. to happen at Damnation. So those ones are a bit more like, <sighs> scything, yeah. as, as Fro says, somebody just having a bit of a wish to get, to get, both for I mean for yourself James I mean how how do you feel when you get that it's the exact same band that you've already said a billion times isn't it happening how do you feel about it I mean I'm not as open with you and, and as regular regularly in contact with people um other than in places like this on the podcast but you actually chatting to them on on the Facebook threads and stuff um so I don't think we get it in quite the same way I mean Bolt Throw is quite a unique example in a way isn't it I mean but if Linkin Park and ACDC can come back then there's never say never on anyone, is it? You don't want to be crass because it involves somebody 
dying, you yeah. know, but lots of, I mean, Linkin Park is bunkers that, 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 that they are going again. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyone, anything's possible. Um, so I, part of me thinks you two are just styling it out now and you've already got it confirmed and in the back. Hey, that's the last thing we need to do. Cheers for that. <laughs> <laughs> they, is it, is it them, them acid bath in Nirvana, the three headliners we're going to have over two nights tonight. <laughs> Kim Jones is asking, what are your opinions on Danny Phil saying in an interview, I believe, with Razor's Edge, that they never agreed to do the old school set? Fucking Ooh. hell, is that true? As well. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> well what, which part? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I guess it's. That. I guess that probably all comes down to the communication between the band, the agent, and the manager. Um, we were very clear um, at the very start when we were in the conversations with with Craig LaFilth that a current touring cycle set just wouldn't it wouldn't suit it wouldn't be kind of suitable for Domination, and we were exploring all sorts of options with them. Would they do a specific one of their their first album or the something just from the first 10 years or whatever? We're trying to agree some sort of wording around that. Um, but we're very clear that we wanted something to reflect the, the kind of the, the earlier the, the earlier sound that the, the Cradle of Filth had. And we I think we had set we tried to say like the first 10 years and then they came back I don't know I can't remember if it was the agent or the manager came back and said they will agree to what we were told was to call it an old school ritual set and we weren't given more details on that until two weeks before the festival when they said it was essentially just going to be all songs from the first five albums now that was the language obviously that the the agent or the manager used whether that had been conveyed back to Danny Filth in the interim, I'm not too sure. Like, and that's where it, I suppose it comes to how a band is ran and managed and organized in their own little internal hierarchical structures. But there was clear agreement in place for some form of specialist set. Did um, they play that? It, this is not like a bleeding through situation, is it? Did they play no. the old school? They they, they, done yes. the, they done the opposite. So what they actually done because, like, first and foremost, right. If you thought the Cradle of Filth were our first choice, they were on that first sheet of paper for damnation, headline damnation, you have lost your marbles. And we got to where we got, and then this Cradle opportunity came. So what Paul's saying is absolutely right. I was the one doing the deal at the time with the agent, and they didn't want to do an, an old school set, and it was pushed back. They, it's much easier for them just to run through the UK and play the same set by playing everybody else. We didn't want that. We were already concerned that it was Cradle of Filth because we knew it would split our fan base. We were concerned that it was a part of a large UK tour that we couldn't make smaller. So we had to differentiate our set for everyone else's set. And we needed it to be that. And we were, it was basically do a, this old school set or it's not a, a show that's going to work for Damnation. So when they went for it, they came up with says they came up with a wording the old school ritual, which created his own problems because then no one knew what an old school ritual was. It was only until really that just recently that it was like it sounded like we were gonna get the good stuff or what, what people would determine to be that old school the first five albums. So I got I don't know. I feel like I feel like he was either he was being sarcastic in that interview in a sense that they probably didn't want to have to make the effort to go and do it but they went and done it anyway. Or I just kind of see any world where and manager and agent got a band with the reputation of Cradle of Filth and, and they they promoted that including Danny Filth on his socials as an old school ritual they used that word on their socials because Paul was convinced I mean he's missed a hypothetical drama for everything when it comes to damnation he <laughs> thinks like, he was convinced that Cradle were just going to show up and literally do the set that we're doing every other night and I was like yep. again again, what can, if they show up what you can do run on and take the microphone off them and sing, sing an old song you're kind of <laughs> it's, da it's damaging their reputation they, they have promoted that as a show so but fair play to them they came and I am not uh, a a Cradle of Filth devotee but there is a lot of people who went to see them at Damnation who are, who were well chuffed with that set, who thought there was a lot of bangers that get pulled out that aren't getting played in the tour. So, I mean, I appreciate anyone in the Cradle of Filth uh, camp hears us. I appreciate the efforts that the band went to make that different. But, aye, it's a question for the band and their management, but I would be stunned if they took the decision without Danny Filth being told that it was going to be an old school ritual set. 
Good. Last question. Hat is up, Phil. Hat right. is up, then we'll get it down the issue. Yes, yes, we will. So Jack Fryer is wondering, when will we get a definite answer on Night of Salvation? And whether, I guess, whether we're going to do one again or or leave yeah. it. That's fucking event. <laughs> Damnations do these. Damnations are enough. There is no night of salvation. Right? Fuck, fuck night of salvation. Let's put it in the bin. This is what we do. Here is damnation next year. Two days. Can it be clearer? What's every question? Where's night of salvation? Right, 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 right. <laughs> like, yeah. Either you believe <laughs> it was already two days and they were giving you two days, or you didn't believe that and night of salvation was a separate event and you want that too. So that, Jeez, oh man, you couldn't even get 48 hours peace for the night of salvation before we're getting there. Right? <laughs> the truth of the matter is, if damnation sells a shit ton of tickets, there is no good reason that we wouldn't put an event on somewhere else in Manchester the night before. We would, it would be it would be stupid promote promotional suicide to just let that amount of people be in Manchester and give them nothing to do. So as it stands right now, as we chat, night of salvation does not exist. There is no venue book, there's no bands book, there's no attempt to book bands for it. It does not exist. But I would be 90% certain that it will, at some point, become a thing. And those conversations will start. And there will be a rebellion or a Manchester Academy free or whatever the equivalent is in somewhere in Manchester that we book three or four or five bands at a push and stick on some hopefully pretty cheap tickets that you can come on a Friday night and do that if you wish. But as it stands right now, it is not going to be Beck Arena. It's not going to become a three-day festival. And I'm quite happy not to be talking about Night of Salvation. I get, I, and I'm not trying to be... I'm not trying to be... Because I get why people are asking. Like, they want to sort hotel rooms. They want to come down that. But it's like, at what point do you need to be like... Like, this is where the event here... And ultimately, if you even if you were to come down to Manchester the night before and there wasn't Night of Salvation, you could go for a few pints and the Grand Central or something, and, and listen to some rock music and come to the event next day. Does that answer the question? Is that the question? Oh, do you feel, do you feel better for that? After that? <laughs> it's good. There's a question once a week about Night of Salvation until we've got yeah. a proper answer, Gav. Yeah. <laughs> Have you booked the venue? Have you booked the venue? Have you booked the venue? What bands? What time? How many? What venue? And then that just then knows it's on you thing because you're going to have the bands that... They, Bands are now going to be inboxing us or sending us emails for an event that doesn't exist yet. We're going to have a venue saying, oh, we'll hold that for you. You're going to have this. Like, you know what I want to do? I want to have a successful two-day damnation next year for its 20th anniversary. That is a priority. Ultimately, you get the other side of it, and I think a salvation didn't exist this year or next year. I would be okay with that. I'd be completely okay with that. Yeah. And to be honest, none of my current feelings of tiredness and brokenness <laughs> Would would welcome a third day at this point. So yeah, yeah. yeah like keep that away. So yeah. I tell you somebody who would welcome a third day, James, because he can't be stopped. Mister fucking Lewis Bruce, that boy is a different type of machine. No, I thought you're impressive at your events, but he'll show up at anybody's event and out drink you, out walk you, be it Satan's Hollow or whatever it is to five in the morning, and then back again the following morning. He's he's unreal. I mean, did you did you catch up with him much over the weekend? Right, he. W- Mate, we were together most of the weekend. He, I went to bed on the first night, and at 1 a.m., I woke up because my phone's ringing. I was thinking, fuck, this is bad. And it's him because the party, as far as he's concerned, I've called it too early, and the party's not over. <laughs> and why aren't we going to Satan's Hollow? So, so, yeah, he's. Um, if anyone was going to hand you a shot of something you didn't want to drink, it was going to be him. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, he was, uh, he was great company, but lively. It was great company. He seemed to listen. What um what he do if he had businesses involved in this scene that were as supportive as um, as Lewis Bruce, all our promoters would all have a lot more money in their pockets. The guy gets involved. He took a sp- stage sponsorship this year. He's obviously got the damnation sauce. Works very closely with both your festivals. Puts his money where his mouth is. And then shows up and reaps the rewards. I believe uh, his sauces sold like. In wildfire, the the damnation sauce did well. His uh, his stage looked brilliant. He seemed to really appreciate. It. I mean, he's a he's a one man business startup. You know what I mean? It's uh, now seen his logo plastered across a a fourteen meter wide uh, main stage screen with some of his favourite bands playing it. So, aye, he's living the dream as far as he's concerned. Help him continue with that dream. Go and visit his site. Bluesbrews.co.uk. Use pod 15. Get 15% off your sauces. 
support him because he supports us. Good, lovely. So, right. Let's talk damnation, shall we? I, I just want to remind you both that the, when this podcast started, it was supposed to be half an hour long. And then we got to an hour and a half, and that was the thing. And then Gav broke us to an hour and 45 at some point. So <laughs> <laughs> we, no, I'm, doing, I'm doing the school pickup in an hour, so, and, and that will be our longest ever episode. So we're not going we beyond that. We, we can't do that anyway, no matter how far away we get, because I need to send this to poor Brian. He needs to be on me. So let's discuss damnation. Now, you want, you've put some... Uh, some points for us to go. So let's start with our musical highlights over both days. You're the, the guest at Damnation in this case, James. What were your musical highlights of the first day? So, um, I mean, the first day, I, I spent most of my time in the pelagic stage, um, as is my want. Um, I, I'm not. I'm just going to name two bands that I really enjoyed. I mean, the, the standout band of that whole day was LLNN. Um, I like the fact that it's now, if you read the Kerrang review of Damnation, and then if you've read it yet, there is some discussion of how you pronounce the band name. And I can't help thinking that you're the one who's made that happen, Gav. They're now, they're now <laughs> discussing it in Kerrang as to how you pronounce LLNN. Um, but they are a fucking force of nature. They absolutely, like as, as they do, they flatten the place. They are, as I've said before, they are a mixture of unbelievable heaviness and unbelievable fun that you didn't think was possible and not fun in like a insanity alert aren't we fun kind of way i mean it's so fucking heavy and oppressive but you can dance to it um they were wonderful and it's almost a bit boring to say i'm not my number two pick from that day is i'm not going to choose the ocean even though i want to because i feel like i've talked about them a lot um the band i've never seen before who i loved were a swarm of the sun um, and you know you've got to wait as is the way with post-rock you've really got to wait for the payoffs but there's there's a lot of them on stage so like about six of them on stage the singer's got like a well Shifty told me it was a theremin I don't know if it was some crazy instrument and when the payoff comes when the big fucking post-rock build-up payoff fucking hits they are something really special to behold um, I really hope that we can get them at Arctangent one year so yeah, great, great first day. Um, I could just reel off a load of bands, but I, I watched eight bands on, on Friday and the, had a really lovely time. I mean, yeah, we go into these things well when I was talking to Paul before, so some bands, because like, you want to do these podcasts and know everybody just repeating themselves, but it, you, you're lying to yourself and at the services if you don't just say L-L-N-N. And I think that yeah. now the, 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 the conversation's been put to bed. He said it on stage. He said, I believe for the first time, we are LLNN. So it's done. He, the band themselves have pronounced it from the stage. So we have to accept it's not Lun, it's not Lun, it's LLNN. They were like skyscrapers collapsing. And they just didn't stop. My wife that morning had gone out and bought the pineapple for Cult of Fire. I had seen the giant cobras getting built. I had met the band. I thought they were gentlemen and I was convinced myself, promised myself I was going to see at least five to ten minutes because I wanted to see Cult of Fire. I couldn't leave the stage. I could not leave. Every time, I was just, it just get more and more intense and I was more and more transfixed until, until they were done. I was like, there might not be. I, I spoke to Hayden, Hayden afterwards, their agent, our agent. And I thought, I said, if there's another set this weekend that's better than LLNN, it'll be one of the best sets of Damnation's ever seen because it was monumental. It was like, I feel like yeah. he's, I feel like Fro's sitting here smug because mm -hmm. he was talking about LLNN like eight years ago when they put out the first demo on a tape. He was going to be like, I very good, Paul, very good, Paul. Now, like, they just, they've <laughs> become this band, this absolute force of nature. And then he fucking wee cherry in the, the cake but for that band was, I was upstairs later and uh, I spotted the guy, like, you're in LLNN. He goes, Oh, mate, it's finally good to see the face behind the voice. He listens to the fucking <laughs> podcast every week as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> then, That's nice. I mean, Swarm of the Sun were great. Employed Empl to serve were great. The other, man, I had to pick a second favourite, probably Sugar Horse. Again, like Ella, uh, when, they, when they get into it, when it actually gets going, great voice, great riffs. Fucking enjoyed that. Enjoyed that first day so much. Mr. Farrington. I think, yeah, yeah. 
there this is one of those ones where there is a, a statistically correct answer and it is LLLM. That's the best band of the day. I am um, I had popped into their dress room earlier in the day because I needed to to run through something with them before their show and I, I knocked in and I just I knew it was their dress room, but I just wanted to walk in and be polite. I said, Are you guys and I and then you get that shit, what do I say? Is it at Lun? Is it L L N N? So I ended up just kind of saying both. Are you guys Lun L L N N? And they both and they just kind of looked at me and went, Yes. I was like, oh, come on, at least give me, just tell me which one it's supposed to be. <laughs> but no, they were, they were so good. I watched the first half of the set from in the crowd. And then I watched the second half from the side of stage with the guys. Like, and it was just biblically heavy. It was just unbearable. Like, um, but it was just so, so good. Um, I love every time I get a chance to watch them, I'll always, I'll always take it. Like, and I'd recommend it to anyone else. If they ever get a chance to see them, you have to see it. Um, Pelagial is one of my favorite albums of the last 15 years. So for me, I think that the, the ocean is probably my, my second choice with a honorable mention mention for Mismore. I thought Mismore was, was brilliant on the, on the Friday as well. Um, yeah. So Friday was really good. What about Saturday for you guys? What was the, James, what were the standout sets? Start this with it's, James. A, it's, I think it's a challenge to choose two from Saturday. Um, because there was so much. Um, I, I particularly, the two bands I'm going to choose didn't didn't play on the main stage, but I just want to give a, sh- a shout out to the main stage that day because I thought the crowd and the atmosphere for, I think it was Gatecreeper, Russian Circles, Nails, oh, that might be the wrong order, Gatecreeper, Nails, Russian Circles, was really fucking amazing. Um, but I'm going back to my favourite stage again. Um, my my band of the whole weekend was Dool, who I've given a lot of love to their album um, from this year. It'll be in my top five or ten of the year, and um, I've never seen them live, um, and they were fucking brilliant. They can recreate the sounds they make on record. They can do it live, which is not to be sniffed at when you're doing the kind of thing they're doing, um, and it's proper proper bangers. And they, I was really happy that they played a bunch of songs off the new album because that's the one that I'm the most excited about even though I know they've got loads of stuff that people really love um, the door were fucking amazing they're so so brilliant um, band of the weekend definitely um, The my second choice is Interarmor because uh, they are so I love Interarmor I think they're one of the, the bands pushing heavy music forward into new fucking more horrible and more experimental realms. But until you've seen them live, you've never, you haven't quite got what Interarmor are. And like the drummer yeah. is in like pink swimming shorts, right? They all look like they've just gone <laughs> to the beach and they've randomly grabbed five people who are not mates and they're definitely not in the same band. <laughs> and they've gone, guys, let's go. And so you're hearing them play this, like, I would compare it to like, you watch Imperial Triumphant and they all look like they're in a fucking cult together. And yeah. you watch, into armor and they look like <laughs> they're not in a band together and they're all at the beach and yeah. in some ways i would probably think that that isn't what i want them to do but actually it really works it's weirdly fun it makes this fucking horrible odd discordant weird fucking death metal really fun and they were fucking great i mean absolutely brilliant and um, you know uh Honourable mention to Russian circles who are always amazing. They yeah, are. I mean, I've watched it. Uh, I watched it in with you, and I would think get the whole. Why are these guys wearing beach well <laughs> on the <laughs> whole stage? Then this horrible sludgy fucking metal. So, aye, that was it. Uh, again, I'm going to nip in the fourth row because there is only one answer, unfortunately, uh, and it's dragged into sunlight. Who? I don't even know what to say. This is this is what happened after I went upstairs and I found the singer, I forgot my singer, the dialect singer. I held his head against my head and I said, Why do you need to be so fucking good? I was <laughs> 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 I was praying for you guys not to be as good because ultimately they put you through it for months and end. I shielded myself a wee bit from it. Paul managed to shield himself a wee bit from it. Mario's probably took it right in the neck and everyone in between. But as the as Dragged Into Sun like, described themselves as like herding cats, they're not even a real band as such. They don't operate really well. They're not in the same space. They've got different fucking members everywhere with different jobs. They're all over the, the gaff. 
So how do you actually manage to pull it all together to create this religious experience of whatever the fuck that was? Is that if any other band tried to do as much sensory overload is dragged into sunlight between the fucking goat skulls and the endless fucking uh, strobes and the the noise and the samples and then the fucking pyro when that kicked in and the screams and the the serial killer theme he would just laugh off as like a bit too comedic but they're just there's something about it just feels fucking absolutely dangerous and I watched the whole thing in the crowd absolutely fucking jaw dropping and my mate Andy said to me at the end of which I hadn't even considered at the time is this better than Mariner and, it, and the truth is arguably <laughs> yes I mean arguably that was the greatest set that's ever happened at any damnation ever and I was just like holy fucking him but you don't like to put too much stock in it in the moment because we've all had that that was my favourite thing I've ever seen and you walk away a couple of days later and like reality sets in you get a bit of context but then you're, you're talking to other people you're like going on the forum people like did you see that like, what the fuck was that I mean like the guy for that TPTV, he watched it and he's still fucking growing up and he's been a metal fan. So it was it was unbelievable. I, I remember walking away from it and I was going to go and catch a bit of Cradle, Cradle of Filth and I just felt eternally sorry. I'm like, how could Cradle of Filth possibly? At any, it was like, it's like watching a fucking natural disaster and then somebody playing with a fucking kid's toys. It was like, how is how can these two things possibly compare? And uh, and unfortunately for for Credo, as much as the fans that they enjoyed that one, it was just it, it couldn't it just felt soft and playful uh, in comparison. So I was I utterly fucking blown away <laughs> with that that sense of you bastards. Yeah, but I, I, the only thing you would ever, ever attempt to book these cunts again in fucking five or ten years is if they put in the greatest show that Dan they ever had and then they went and done it. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot, you spent the last few months avoiding saying these cunts, so now you're, now you're in. But, uh, yeah. Just to peek, to, to let everyone peek behind the curtain, the only times I saw either of you stressed this week, that last weekend, I would ask you, and you'd just be like, you just like look at the floor, shake your head, and be like, yeah, dragged into sunlight. And yeah. and, and and on um, Friday night, Paul was like, um, I I take you. There was me, Loose Bruce, and a couple of others. And Paul was like, very kindly, I'll take you up on the main stage. I know a shortcut. Follow me. We went out the fire escape, down the stairs. We um, we got to the back door of the main stage, and it was locked. So Paul went into the production office to get a key, I think, or to get to radio someone to let us in. And then we were just stood there, and like, and and he and he didn't come back. And we we're like, uh, Lou's saying he's not coming back, and I'm like, he's definitely he'll come back. He's a hundred percent coming back. And we we're all, I mean, we are too pissed for me to be going into the production office at this point. But eventually, I just bowled into the office, and there's like seven people sat there in really deep conversation, and everyone looks <laughs> really, really stressed. And Paul just looked at me and he goes, dragged into sunlight. And I was like, okay, see you later. <laughs> I just like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, he's not coming back, guys. He's gone. So I, I the, tour is over. the tour is over. <laughs> the tour's not happening. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, Honestly, I'll, I'll, I'll let you jump out but, uh, in a second. Paul. And the other one, I mean, I, I, fuck, there's so many other, because I saw so many great sets at, at that damnation. But uh, just the pandemonium and nails. I think people just lost their entire mind. I mean, they came out straight into you'll never be one of us. The full fucking tight as fuck, pyro starting, the pit just never stopped the whole time. Thank you to the, uh, the security that caught every, because some of the guys going over that barrier were big boys. I mean, meaty boys that were going to go, and the security were having to catch them two at a time. So thank you for not letting those guys split their head open on the bottom of that module barrier. But yes, bro. Yep. Though, just yeah. Me, sorry, just let me jump in for two seconds. Those are the two sets, actually, that I would say that you as a booker, you must have been fucking high-fiving yourself because Nails and Dragged Into Sunlight were the ones where you like you got in front of everyone else and you got the really exciting bookings that no one else had. And it and that is like a... They are, clearly, if you look at the feedback online and from what everyone was saying when we were there, it was just like they were the sets that really caught people's attention. So I, I, I don't, play. I don't overestimate, and I, I, people listen to this podcast. I don't overestimate what I do as a job, as as a as a. I don't think I'm a genius. I'm not a fucking brain surgeon. Um, well, what we are doing, ultimately, I don't feel like 
is all that special, right? That you're not, I mean, you're just a guy who's working hard at something, you try and do something you're passionate about. But I honestly felt probably for the first time ever when I was watching that dragged into sunlight set and how that all how it all panned out in the pyro and and, just, and how the crowd reacted. That there was nowhere in the world, there was nowhere in the world at any event that dragged into sunlight could have had a better performance than damnation. It was built for damnation. And I, I didn't need the singing to tell me this afterwards, but their best show they'd ever done was Mary Land Death Fest. And then they said, look, that fucking the book we just done there blew it out of the water. Now they're due to go back to Maryland Death Fest. And I would guarantee it will not be what that performance was. And I don't know where they could go, what they could play that would have that again. And Damnation has found its niche in that where the <laughs> the unwanted and extreme reprobates of the world and our fan base combined, you can get those shows, the Anno Nathrax, the Nails, the you know, not so much carcasses, but that sort of realm, dragged mm. into sunlight as well. That's where they're supposed to be. It's not the small one there. It's not the big, even your art tangents, bloodstocks, anyway, where you can get lost a wee bit and the, the tents or maybe the production is not going to available for you or the headline slot in the dark times is not going to be available for you. Where you need to be, if you're that band, is damnation. And that was, at that point, in that moment, I was like, this is special because I do feel like we have achieved something to become this kind of event. Pat, myself on the back, yeah. There you go. Well done. <laughs> well done, you. What you yeah, I'm fun? not gonna. Yeah, I'm not going to. I'm not going to parrot it. I'm. I'm repping the t-shirt for them to, or the the hoodie for them today. Um, it was the best set in 20 years of doing this that we've we've put on, and it does eclipse Mariner. Uh, as difficult as that is to say, it was unbelievable. Um, and I said this. Uh, this is the thing with with. Um, and Gabba said on, on this podcast and the other podcasts and stuff, they are so meticulous as a band, but this is this is the payoff. It is it is difficult, it is challenging, and they're very precise and they want this today and that way. But that's the payoff. Um an interesting thing, I suppose, maybe a little behind again behind the curtain. They had one rehearsal for that show. They performed, oh, wow. they performed on the Thursday. They all got together on the Thursday and did one full band full set rehearsal and that was it um speaking to the, the singer it was like it's all about just the them getting on stage and just the rage from they don't want to over rehearse it because then it kind of it, it, they lose their own internal energy so yeah one phone rehearsal and we got that as a as a show from them um which was just it was outrageous how good that was how much of a sensory overload um and it just all worked really really well uh outside of that nails were amazing I really loved uh, A.A. Williams. I thought her set was was amazing. Yeah. I was I spoke to Alex afterwards, and I was just like, that was really really good. You could I watched it from the side of stage. You could hear a pin drop in there for for some of the songs. There was it was she was I thought she was amazing. Um, it was yeah, there was just it was a really just a kind of a solid a solid day of music. But the, it's hard then when you have a band like Dragged who just set that benchmark just so much higher for a set that it's hard then to kind of hold hold a candle on any of the other sets to what, it because it just was, was something well, else. We, we spoke about this, James, as well. Like, it was just, it was a bit too much. Like, <laughs> there was just too much music. You know what I mean? It's like, at one point, you're a bit like, you need to take a band off or you're going to kill yourself. It was just, it, and you saw people going, how the hell do you go for fucking 200 stab wounds to gatekeeper, gatekeeper into fucking nails, nails into bleeding through? It, was just, it just felt like it was never ending like six slots in a row are just pure nonsense. Well, on, on Friday, on Friday at like midday, we and we'd come in hung over and tried to get ourselves back in the game. I looked at the cash finder and I said to my brother, I'm in fucking trouble here because all the stuff I'm really excited about is hours away. Like it's hours and hours away. It's like because it was like Dual, Interama, Russian Circles, Ahab, you know, that run. And I'm like, I'm not sure I can. Yeah. So it was a proper proper ram today and you know it started with pine as well at midday i was in there for midday and, aye, aye. And, uh, and, yeah. and the crowd is it's, i mean much like art tangent as well uh, the crowds are there from the start pine was busy and force was rammed it's like this yeah. is you're here now for 12 hours guys i mean uh buckle in because it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be an adventure <laughs> yeah it was it was great i mean i, I just want, i don't need to think i didn't see dragged into sunlight either i even though ahab was right at the top of my list of choices i I left Ahab to watch a bit of drags just to make sure I'd seen it, but I think it's quite a hard thing to to join. It was <laughs> That's like, a hard adjustment. It was, like, it was fucking too much. Like because Ahab's quite like Ahab's <laughs> like quite dreamy. 
And you literally just walk down the corridor and then you're in like fucking hell. Just walk down to hell. You've literally just... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would be a weird one. I don't think... You're not just dipping in. You're not just dipping into a bit yeah. of the fucking... I mean, you're there in, for the whole experience. So, aye, it was uh, it was crazy. In terms of stresses, though, I have to say the whole, the whole weekend, there, there's something about... There's something about not having something to do that generates its own stress. Because you're like, mm. you're always waiting for that. I think when you're busy and there's things keeping you occupied, you're not waiting for the impending doom. But I feel like I, the whole weekend, I remember that the colour ran out in the printer when we needed to print the pass sheets. So we were scrambling about to try and find a new printer and Cradle of Filth needed a second mirror. That's the two I remember. From, what's that, 50 bands landing for across the world to come and play a 5,000 plus bands. And I remember that at one point we were looking for a second mirror and we needed a new printer of a colour. That's just how smooth it went from, from my point of view. It was good yeah. seeing you um, at 3 p.m. on Friday. You were like bouncing because you were like, it's just like nervous energy, but not, not necessarily in a good way. You were like, I think you just wanted it to start and like the gates are open. We need the bands to start. And but yeah, you looked super after that. So, you know, five or six PM, you super relaxed. I thought the whole, the whole thing really. Yeah, yeah. Good. I think yeah. The worst, the worst I had on the production side of it. Gillian Carter blew a bass head, and they had to keep the crowd entertained for five minutes whilst I was swapping over, which happens all the time. And it was um, it was a super easy fix for the for the team to to swap out and sort. But I was I was outside in the the food area chatting to people about maybe two o'clock on the on the Saturday. And I commented to them how how tired I was, how like just physically tired I felt. But I, in a, in an odd way, I thought that was a really positive sign of how the day was going because I'm Susie's usually, usually so wound up with adrenaline because need to do this, need to do that, this has to happen. Someone's fallen down a flight of stairs, someone has set themselves on fire, whatever the fuck it is, that you're just constantly on the go. And because there was nothing, because everything was going quite smoothly, I didn't have that overabundance of of uh, adrenaline and just kind of started to almost kind of crash out a little bit um which right. is actually quite a good sign for the how smooth the day was going um but yeah there really were not any major hiccups at all so it's from here now it's all about kind of making those little uh improvements the the things that kind of the, the customers want us to kind of take the feedback from them build on us and kind of move forward and kind of see what we can improve on going forward well, how have you guys felt about the? Sorry, you go, Gab. I know, but I'm going to lead into that then. So, how how you were a, cu- a customer, I guess, but let's just say a, a customer, and you're walking about the venue. What what's the, what the feedback? What's your feedback? Every event can be improved, but no one's sitting here going, "Oh, everything is just perfect." What is it you think? You know what? Nail this bit, tweak that, and that's a there's another one. Well, I don't think everyone. I mean, I thought it was great, and I don't think everyone would agree with what I'm going to say. That there's only one bit of feedback I'd give as a consumer. And I, if I was you, and, and you're probably not going to agree with this, and some of your customers won't either, I would put all the merch in one place. Like, there was, there was three locations for merch, I would say. Yeah. Um, where you could buy T-shirts or patches or vinyl or whatever. And I would have it all outside in that thing. Because I personally, I like shopping. I mean, I did feel sorry for your mum. Your mum, your dad, your brother, your wife. And your child, who've been put on the damnation merch between fucking right in the middle of three stages, they must have been able to hear everything <laughs> fucking once. Um, I just want them experience um, it, James. I want them to have an experience. Yeah. <laughs> so they got dragged into sunlight. They can hear Cradle of Filth sound check. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I, personally, I would put it all in one place. But I'm, I, I'm happy for that. People will say that's bollocks. So, um, but other than that, look. Really easy to get a drink, um, really easy to get food. Uh, and, and the most important thing for me is uh, the stages sounded and looked great. That You could get between them super easy. The sound bleed was pretty much non-existent. There really wasn't any sound bleed, I didn't think. Um, so, yeah, I mean, really fucking great. I had, a, I had an absolutely brilliant time. So, yeah. I mean, in terms of uh, the biggest things, I was off, as I say, I was off social media for that weekend. I just find it, I find it disheartening because I, no one focuses on the bigger picture things usually. It's usually something that's hyper 
focused and specific to them at that, that exact moment. Uh, this is a fucking joke, this festival. I can't find the cloak room. You know what I mean? And it's just like, I just, I can't be reading that at the same time as trying to deal with everything else. You just, I just don't enjoy the day. So when I logged back in and people were saying, I thought it was drink prices, but I think just pick any festival out the hat and drop it aside. <laughs> The, the argument is drink prices. We, we had to laugh. Somebody said, oh, I suppose that was the benefits of Leeds. I mean, it's amazing how hindsight is not 2020. Yeah. We get dogs abuse for the drink prices at Leeds and pints were 3 50 or 4 quid. So if you think that there's somewhere that you go that the drink prices will not get to be complained about, everyone wants it to be a local bowling club. Everyone wants a Jack D or a rum and coke for 99 pence. It's not happening. And I get it. Non-alcoholic beverages in your head shouldn't be as expensive, but they're more expensive than alcohol to bring in for the for the venue to get that's more expensive. So I'm not sure what to do about it. Secondly, we get no control about it. We get no slice of that pie. We would love the drink spices to be cheaper, but there's a bigger uh, conversation in like, if we don't sell any drinks and alcohol or beverage and everybody can just get a soft drink for 99 pence and that's all people are buying, your ticket price is definitely going up because the venue owner's putting 20, 30 grand on the bill to us. And then 20, 20, 30 grand needs to go to the belt with the tickets. And then there you go. There's there's no way you're getting rid of it. That's just one part of the the jigsaw, uh, uh, how you fund these kind of events. And we get the venue for cheaper because that guy makes bars. Art Tangent and Trees can keep their t- ticket prices because their pints aren't £2. You know what I mean, if you could go, everyone buy a ticket for £500, you've got, you can all have £2 pints, then that would be a way around about it. But no one wants to pay £500 for the ticket. So drinks prices are just one of these necessary evils. And let's face it, seven pound at a pint, a seven pound at a festival, isn't isn't much different to what you're paying in a high street now. I was paying up to nine pound for pints at other events, so it's not like we are trying to set this new standard on that either. And if you really want to look at it, a holy goat for eight pound is robbery because that same pint, if you went to a a, a, a beer festival, you wouldn't even get it in a pint. It'd probably cost you about fifteen quid. So, aye, it's I'm sorry, it's expensive, and I'm sorry people feel they're getting ripped off, but. Firstly, it's not damnation doing it. And it's just part and parcel of 2024 Great Britain. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fair enough. Um, the two pinters, mate. But after all that banter last week, and then R- Rob went to the bar and he came back with a round of drinks for everyone. And the only two pints we bought is for me. And you look like an absolute <laughs> prick standing in a group of people. <laughs> and they're all drinking a pint and you've got a two pinter. You just you look like you're trying to show, look at me. Yeah, the, the, the other thing I want to make a point is seating. Now, people, there was seating marked on the map at the back of the main stage. That should have been removed. That was never going to be there and will never be there when you do 5,000 plus tickets. Anyone who thinks you could put wooden benches at the back of that main stage when gatekeeper or nails are playing is looking for people to go to hospital. You would have walked into it. It would have been a version of coming back for Leeds and Reading when people are sitting in camp chairs in the middle of a festival. You would have walked into it and broke your fucking leg. Uh, yeah. gave yourself a real good thing. There is no opportunity. I mean, you can look at it at A.A. Williams or Cradle of Filth and go, oh, there's lots of dead space, but you can't kind of count the dead space being there at the start of the day or the end of it. You need to plan for the full weekend. And Nails and Gatekeeper filled that room. So, yeah. uh, aye, that's, there's not going to be seating in there for successful donations. We spent four grand in a separate seated tent, which I'm told always had availability, and we put three times the amount of benches out in front of the food traders. So, it's about... I don't know what more we could do. Maybe we can put benches around the perimeter of the back stage three. We thought it was going to be a bar in there, so only realised on the day that that wasn't the case. And maybe, maybe there's some scope to put benches in the back arena too. But that may also cause its own problems. Over and above that, there is just no scope for extra seating in the building being safe. Yeah, yeah so it's just not sense. an option. Like. I would like to hear as well, like we put urinals in for the very first time. I don't know how they went down. So, and and the shape and layout of it. We put urinals on and then we put toilets, specifically pink toilets. So people would feel like, oh, leave them to the to the women. Guys use your urinals. And hopefully it's not a case of guys who just need a pee queuing up for half an hour with everyone else to, to get them. I've not had any feedback at all and whether that worked or not, but it's usually a good sign that it did work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I used your urinal and I have nothing bad to say. It was a very, very good suitable to urinal. <laughs> it, was a, it was a fucking great urinal. What else What really fantastic? And I want here, please give this guy's five stars, the app. Now, your brother, yes. had, your brother had to remind me about 10 times, why am I checking the stage times and then going to try and find the time to marry up with it when you had literally the app with a line going through showing you exactly where you were on the day, worked offline, worked online. 
it's amazing. People really enjoyed it. We were able to get the tickets on sale with a notification this week too. They've nailed it. So glad we've got it. It's by a company called Meliora from the Ghost album. They are very reasonable priced. If you run a festival and you would like an app, get in touch with them. Meliora.events or get in touch with them via myself or the podcast and we will put you in touch with them. You guys enjoy your app experience. Yeah. And Joe was great about it. The the guy Darren who who runs that company, Meliora, he was he was there at the weekend and unfortunately I didn't get to see him. And if I did actually get to see Darren, I'm really sorry, I've completely forgotten, which is probably a, a testament to the state I was in by the end of the weekend. But we put out the notification about the the stage signings or Ahab and thing you were doing signings during during the weekend. And I put out that notification. And Darren was clearly still working because he then messaged me and was like, Oh, by the way, the notifications disappear. So I've just put it onto the, the first item on the news. So people open that. So he did that. He updated the app there and then and started keep kept on make sure all the information was all up to date. So he, the guy was an absolute hero on the day. So so yeah, big yeah. thanks to to Darren for his his wonderful app. And this isn't a third party company just out there to make money. Again, much like Lewis Bruce, this is a guy who attends 2000 Trees. It's a guy who attends uh, Art Tangent, he attends Damnation, he loves this music. So it's again, just keeping in sync with Holy Goat, Lewis Bruce, all these kind of companies that are invested in the events as well. And it's not just Coca Cola with a new product. So we'll quickly, last five minutes, so we're not breaking any new records, but we talk about. Any changes for next year? And then James is going to tell us the headliners we should book. Yeah, look forward to that. What's happening next year, Paul? Give it the big sale. Oh, God. Well, two days, two full days from bright and early 12 o'clock or whatever, both days. Um, Still be the same three stages, but it'll be just about kind of, again, making those small improvements. Maybe having a bigger merch tent outside, like James says, so all the merch is all in one place or seeing what we can do to improve the seating experience not that there's going to be seating in the venue but whether we can put more outside um it will just be again it's all going to just be the the, the little things that make sure uh things run on time on um, on the back end of things improving our production a little bit more angela who joined our team this year absolutely smashed it but having her involved meant the bands all arrived correctly she was much more on top again them arriving on crime correctly which means the changeovers all happened correctly which meant there was no delays in the stage times the stage time stages all ran to time which was again something in the past we've had problems with so there's it'll be all of those things the little things behind the scenes that probably won't all be immediately obvious but will make the event feel better overall um the traders i've had feedback uh, from the traders they all had really good weekend of takings um the feedback from most of the fans was that the food choices were excellent uh, i think nearly the majority of those traders have requested to come back again next year so the, your favorite ones from this year will probably be there again next year um but yeah, no, it'll all be just about kind of little improvements. Take what we've done and make it that a little bit better, so people feel like they're they're getting their bang for their buck from their their early bird tickets that they've already bought. Yeah, and we've get it's probably been overlooked in it, but no one does less than ten percent booking fee on, and we've went to schedule and we <laughs> schedule. The, the reason that there was a hold up getting tickets out was schedule didn't really know if it would go to five percent. They said we could set it to zero or we could set it to ten, but. We need to make sure that actually it works at 5%. So that's why it took a wee bit to come out. Take advantage of those. It's working out your... T- a ticket for Damnation was £80. ticket for Night of Salvation was £80. Next year, with the two days, they're £77.50. Well, it's actually gone down in price if you buy it now and you can get a, a, 5, a, 5, a 5% booking fee. So the support right off the bat, it means the it means the world is... We do have exclusive grind core. We do have some dance music. We do have... Death Metal, we have got the UK exclusive, we have got Black Metal, we've got next year's lineup is going to be the idea, the theme of it is it's getting together, probably going to be a lot of new bands, exciting bands on the Saturday, a lot of old favourites on the Sunday, but two days are absolutely everything you'd expect to see at a damnation. What we don't have yet, and what we're going to struggle with is because James has booked them all as headliners. So, yeah. <laughs> so what have you left us for next year, James? Left us, James? What James. can we get for your pile? <laughs> Good. Well, you won't be pleased and you won't be surprised to know that I think you should really bite the bullet and book um, this little album called The Blackening in full. That would be perfect. And I mean it. That is a perfect damnation booking. 
absolutely perfect. The, the plain bloodstock, you madman. No, mate. No, but nobody wants. Yeah. yeah, but when they play bloodstock, they'll play a mixture of all their stuff. Some of which is not very damnation. The blackening, right? The blackening. Um, okay. Next one, em Emperor. Have you had Emperor before? No, they also no. play bloodstock. I mean, also play bloodstock. <laughs> mate, who gives a shit? Seriously, it's in November. You're right, though. No, that's a good point. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go smaller now. You ready? Yeah. Eaton. Eaton. We talked yeah. about this before. Yes. Yeah. Seriously, have you actually listened to them? I would have heard them on the... Because I actually listened to the, the On The Record playlist, unlike yourself, James. So, yes, I would have heard them. I do remember enjoying them without them particularly standing out in my head. And get it on the third stage next year. And then the most important booking of all, which I would like to see next year is two promoters, one pod live, because we've given you a one-year grace to get your systems and processes sorted. And 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 now we're on. And offline, we can talk about mm -hmm. some ideas I've got. You could headline You could headline a Night of Salvation if you want. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, not, I'll look at Night, Night of Salvation. Night, Night of Salvation was one of my ideas, but I thought Gav would be a bit stressed to be doing it. The what, night uh, what stage do you want, James, since you're, since you're booking all this? What stage do you want for the two promoters, one pod? Well... Third stage, or you could do a special one up in the um, the Star Wars bar because there's a little stage up there. There is a lovely stage yeah. up there. That could be lovely up there. That, hey, I that's, tell you what, that's, that's not that's, bad. That's, that's not a bad, bad idea. idea. It's not the worst thing you've ever came up with, James. Mate, I've, I mean, I've, I've literally, because I've been walking around, that's all <laughs> I've thought about for the whole weekend. <laughs> okay. It's either opening, opening the third stage or later on in the Star Wars bar. There you go. Oh, James, 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 James. So, so as a man, that's a, that's a forum comment, because right? a man who knows the figures and fees that bounce about in budgets, Machine Head doing the blackening and fill, is that what we'll go for? Oh, yeah, it's punchy, isn't it? That? It's, <laughs> it's, it's, gonna, it's not going to be cheap. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's going to be 100 gonna be grand plus, yeah. that is, but I think it's worth it. it 100, grand, 100 grand plus and 6,000 Machine Head fans who'll turn up at 9 o'clock with zero interest in watching the rest of the bill. Aye, aye, aye. But James, just uh, James is there the blackening. Them, <laughs> them and Eaton. Uh, right, okay. Let's get let's wrap this up. Pleasure having you on, Paul. See us through Always. with an, a cracking on the record. Right, I've gone for a, a kind of a. Well, they're not a newish band. They've been around probably about ten years, but they might be not the most well-known band in the world. So they're called To the To the Star. No, sorry, Together to the Stars, and they're a Swedish um, kind of blackened black metal band kind of in the similar vein to to deaf heaven um they released their newest album about a month maybe two months ago and so the track i'm picking is called mercurius and it's the first track off that album and it's a i think it's a really really good album so um yeah so the band are called together to the stars and the track is mercurius okay okay james you see that you picked a band then a song to be added to it it's like first go and you got it right I'm on top of it. I've got it now. Okay, so I was going to put Eaton on for a second time, and then you reminded me that I'd already done that. So um, another band I'd like you to book, you probably have had in the past, is Tribulation. Have they played Damnation? Yeah, on a package that I, can, I think must have fell apart. So they were booked and then never played. So yeah. the reason I'm asking for these two bands is because I don't think they're suitable for my festival. So the only way I can do it is if you book them. Tribulation, I really love this band. They're like, on the face of it, I guess, a black metal band, but really, musically, there's very little black metal left in them now. They're, it's very, like, super catchy and kind of... Uh, it's almost like Kiss does black metal. I don't know how you really describe it. We've got a new album out. I've only... Oh, he almost made that. He almost made it to the end. Is it? Made us. That's one of the ones we're going we're, we're gonna to have to guess. We're going to have to wait. <laughs> hey, tell, us, tell us a song, James, before we lose you again. Saturn coming down. <laughs> Saturn coming down. Saturn okay. coming down. Well, I will finish this off while well, James still has uh, some sort of connection with a band that is not catchy, but has probably released the album of 2024, which is Crippling Alcoholism. And the opening track, I'll pay more if you let me watch. They are better than Chat Pile. Let's just say that right off the bat, get people's backs up. They, it's fucking bleak. Uh, I think the whole it's a concept album built on... Uh, tales from inmates and this one's about basically hiring kills to murder your family and the reasons that will do it it's bleak as but done in a weird I don't know synthy 1970s catchy I mean a bit of a spoken word but just 
so good that I can't say enough good things about this band. This album, um, I think it's worth love from a paddy room. The song is I'll Pay More If You Let Me Watch, Crippling Alcoholism. Get on the comments, tell me why I put Knocked Out of the Park and James's choice is not the best one for once. And don't worry, be Paul's either. <laughs> <laughs> one final thought, the Damnation merch this year is spectacular. I am wearing the Jim Bob Isaac one. It's printed in Earth Positive. You know I love and good brand. This is an absolute peach t-shirt. I'll be getting restocked maybe in the next couple of days. Go to damnationfestival.co.uk forward slash merch and help us shift the rest of that on. The merch tent was a <laughs> the merch tent was an event in itself this weekend between nails dragged into sunlight bleeding through in our So aye, there's stuff left to go and get. Paul Thank you so much for joining us. James, we will get having me guys. back. If you've listened all the way to the end, you're probably somebody who likes to buy a ticket to the Two Promoters One Pod. 10 a.m. tomorrow. Let's get it done. Yeah, later, Cheers, guys. Cheers.